Better. So welcome to this uh, first foresight study panel session. Um, this one is focusing on identifying long-term knowledge gaps to improve our critical infrastructure resilience and performance. Uh, we've got with us here today Professor Stavrula Conto um, from the University of, uh, oh, I've forgotten, sorry, um, Patras, that's right. I did look it up earlier and then I've managed to forget. Uh, we've got Samson Degado, who we heard speaking earlier, and Jan Lowy from Lulia University in Sweden um, for this session. What we've done is we've, we've primed our panel members uh, with a list of questions, which myself and Yanis have in front of us here. And our intention is for the, the best part of the next hour and a half, um, to work through these questions, picking the brains of our panel members on what their thoughts are from the perspectives of sure. academics and um, uh, people that are dealing with critical infrastructure and consulting as well. And what we're going to look for is input from the audience as well. And myself and Yanis will wander around with these uh, microphones, getting your input in order for us to form this first foresight study. Um, I'll be taking notes as we go, because what we're going to do with the information that we glean from this session is write a short report wrapping together all of the, the findings that we have from the discussion, which we're hoping will, will sort of give us some direction and drive uh, for, for some of our developing uh, joint research activities in developing uh, the techniques required to model these critical infrastructure problems. Um, so with that, uh, I think we will kick off perhaps with uh, a brief introduction from each of the panel members uh, about who they are, what their expertise is uh, relative uh, to this foresight study, uh, and then we'll start thinking about some of the questions in turn that we've uh, primed them with. So, Stavrulu, if I can start with you. Uh, thank, thank you. Uh, so my name is Tavrula Kodoe. I am an academic. I have recently moved to University of Patras from Imperial College, where I spent the previous 20 years of my life. Um, and uh, I have dealt over the years with a whole range of infrastructure-related um, um, uh, structures. Uh, in more, more recently has been slopes and dams, and more particularly tailings dams for the storage of mining material. And uh, a considerable part of my research is in, uh, in offshore wind. And we have seen in the last few days, a couple of days here in Geolab, a lot of offshore wind for a very good reason that uh, uh, energy related questions, they, they are bound to dominate our discussion this afternoon because uh, for reasons we all know very well. So offshore is one of the, offshore wind, one of the solutions to uh, this problem and um, this is reflected, I think, to how much has dominated the GeoLab discussions um, the last couple of days. So for me, we'll get more the academic perspective, uh, I guess, and uh, maybe over to you. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> My name is Samson Dagago. I work at the uh, Directorate of Public Roads in Norway. So. After my PhD, I worked 12 years in the road department in Norway, uh, designing, maintaining, and uh, yeah, yeah, supervision and construction of roads and bridge foundations. And uh, the last five, six years working in the development of guidelines and research implementation. So the type of critical structures that I deal with is related to the road network bridges and uh, all type of hazards related to that one. Basically, mobility of uh, people in land. Yeah. Yeah. My name is Jan Lau. I did my PhD on cyclic loading, which is more or less still a topic after I looked, looked at the talks yesterday and uh, the presentations on Monday. And then I was a consultant for two years. Went to Switzerland, worked here at ETH for 17 years. And since seven years, I'm at Lulia in northern Sweden. And the critical infrastructure in the time in Bochum was mostly foundation techniques, offshore foundations, site, all type of site loaded foundations. In Switzerland, basically everything, but mostly geotechnical nat natural hazards. Because it's more and more slope failures, more and more closage of streets, closure of transport infrastructure, threatening of pipelines, all through this uh, mass movements. And <clears throat> since I'm in Lulia, there we have the most particular infrastructure are the aging hydropower stations or hydropower embankment dams, which really deteriorate over the years. They're not anything more like they've been 80, 90 years ago when they were built. We also have mining related questions, especially tailings. And of course, up north, climate induced 
challenges to the tailings. And we have the change in climate itself. So up north, we have several more thaw, freeze thaw cycles a winter, where the nature usually is used only to one. And that causes basically a challenge to all kind of infrastructure we have, not only the critical one. Yeah, that's probably as a start. Is it here now? Oh, it's working now. Good. I won't turn it off again. Learned my lesson there. Um, that's a very nice introduction to the expertise of our panel here. Um, with respect to the first question that we have for this session, uh, we were asked. Uh, Sam, Sam. Uh, there would be a presentation, I think, or not? Uh, yes. Could we pop the questions up as we go, Alex? Would that be possible? No. I mean, we've sort of covered the first question with our three panel members here, but it'd be interesting to get uh, perspective from the rest of the room about what sort of critical infrastructure you're all dealing with in your current positions. Um, yeah, I, I think what we can do, uh, Alex has a presentation de describing the technology readiness levels for our, our various uh, physical modelling capabilities. I think we can come back to that in a minute. If we can just spend a few minutes just getting people's perspectives on, on what critical infrastructure is relevant to them, I think that'd be a good kickoff, and then we can come back to that presentation if that's okay. Um, so we just put it out to the room. Uh, has anybody got anything to add in terms of what critical infrastructure is important to them at this point in time? And I can wander around with the microphone. Any volunteers? Do you have a favorite critical infrastructure? That we haven't already mentioned. Yeah. You can see how the effect of interaction of microbes generates or propagates in the huge Okay, so we've got gas and pipelines. Anybody, anybody else got anything to add? Dead. Yeah. yeah. Anybody got anything else to add? Or perhaps we've covered everything already. No, here we go. There, there is also some need to. To have attention for the the ballast of the rail tracks, there is um, not uh, infinitely much ballast, at least in Switzerland, not. Perfect. So another transport-related issue there. Anybody else got any other interesting areas of critical infrastructure that they're working on that we ought to uh, capture in this session? No. Okay. Probably well, we can okay. come back to that. If people have got things to add. Uh, then please do so and uh, chip in a little later on. Oh, sorry, Suzanne, you have to really grab me. Uh, maybe it's not so surprising about the railways. We have in the Netherlands a large problem with railways because uh, we cannot um, 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 give permission to drive faster with longer trains and heavier weights because we have stability problems when we calculate with uh, on the stability of these uh, railways. But we don't have failures. Okay, so improving the speed and presumably then the capacity of rail systems, another and key piece of critical infrastructure. It's the same for, for roads, about at least about the weight. I don't think about the velocity, but the weight is a real problem to reduce traffic. Mm. So to reduce transport, you have to use heavier cars, heavier vehicles, but then the infrastructure is not built for that heavier vehicles. Very good, yeah. We've uh, we've experimented in the UK with starting to use what we call the hard shoulder on the side of motorways as an extra lane. It's not been entirely successful. I think it's resulted in more accidents than we used to have, but uh, there is pressure, I guess, to increase throughput of, uh, of our road systems too. Anybody else got anything they'd like to add or should we move on to our presentation just to prime the room? Yep. Um, yes, I want to add that, especially for soft grounds, 
no, the, the, the issue. Um, and there is a general problem, let's say in Europe, also for vibration issues for the railway roads. Also, when you go faster or when you have more trains, you have more vibration in the buildings. So that's also always an issue. So I can add, for Germany, we have the same with the rail tracks, but not only on soft ground. So for any for any slopes, for any any embankments, we have that question. I would say any, anything related to energy can be considered critical. And as in Switzerland, for example, we have a lot of uh, hydropower dams. And uh, these were built uh, many years ago. And there is currently a, an ongoing effort to, to reassess, for example, the seismic, uh, let's say, strength capacity, one example. Uh, there is also in Switzerland an issue with uh, what do we do with nuclear waste and uh, because there are nuclear uh, power plants. <coughs> what happens? Okay, better. Uh, there are nuclear power plants and uh, there is again a very big project, uh, a system of tunnels that will be constructed to store this nuclear waste. This is not existing yet, but it will be existing. So I would say this is also in the category of critical infrastructure. Uh, from my own perspective, just chiming on on Yanis's point about energy systems, I'm I'm particularly interested in the resilience of cable systems for offshore wind turbines. And I think the more of these wind turbines are putting in, especially as you move into deeper water with floating solutions, the cables are going to be a critical aspect of that. And so I'm personally looking at that as a piece of critical infrastructure because you can imagine if you um, have a, a an export platform uh, and a couple of export cables coming off it, and they that one of them breaks. You don't really have a great deal of redundancy because, in fact, the cable sat next to it that's there as a as a spare is actually exactly the same. It's probably suffered the same environmental conditions uh, for that time. So that's that's an area that I'm personally interested in. Anybody else got anything we, they would like to add, or should we move on to uh, our presentation now that we've got a feel for what people are most interested in? It sounds like energy and uh, transport systems are two key focuses that we should capture in the review. Okay. Transport systems in general, I think also. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Alex, should we move on to your presentation? Uh, just to prime the room with a few things to think about in terms of what we have in terms of uh, capabilities. Okay. This is indeed just priming the room a bit. Um, maybe it's a good thing that we went first with the, to the question related to critical infrastructure, just to identify a bit and map what the, the main elements are. Uh, what I'm going to show you here is maybe a, a short summary of um, the deliverable 991 that Sam just mentioned uh, um, a couple of hours ago. Uh, some of you have seen this before, some of you didn't. What we did in this deliverable was to, to identify some societal needs. And uh, we did this by investigating or reviewing actually the, the latest projects that were, let's say, funded by the main uh, funding agencies in Europe. And then uh, by looking at them, and I'm showing just some of them here, not all of them, uh, we, we try to identify indeed what are the societal needs. So what, what's actually happening in the society? <clears throat> society changes, there's new needs which, which arise. And then by identifying those needs, we try to also connect them to, to some experimental challenges that we have as research, uh, let's say, uh, um, research infrastructure owners and uh, users. And then in this table, you see quite a, uh, quite a short summary of uh, whatever we, we, we investigated or we reviewed in this, in this deliverable. And I'm just going to go one by one in the next slides and try to see or try to show you how technology actually helped research infrastructure owners to really deal with those experimental challenges. And this would actually trigger you into thinking about what's going to happen in the future. And actually, this is also the purpose of this foresight, foresight study to identify future societal needs associate with them experimental challenges. So we think what's going to be difficult for us uh, to, 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 to evaluate experimentally, and then what kind of technology can we harness to, to, to address such, such challenges. So the first one is the increase, uh, the increase of resilience of coastal and infrastructure, or offshore infrastructure against extreme weather events. This is, of course, a very hot topic now. Uh, and uh, one of the experimental challenges that uh, I'm going to relate to is to investigate the water soil structure interaction. This is indeed a very complex uh, uh, process and uh, uh, needs a lot of uh, uh, experimental work and uh, research activities. Uh, and then one example of, of technology that was used, uh, and this is again a cross-cutting technology, so it was not specifically developed for geotechnical engineers, 
but uh, it, it came over as a cross-cutting technology. And this is the 3D printing of, uh, of granular soils in this case. Uh, and you have heard uh, some presentations or some, you have seen some slides about 3D printing of granular soils. So what's the main purpose here? The main purpose is to, to, to produce basically artificial soil, uh, a granular material in this case, with full and decoupled control of particle morphology, size and mechanical properties. And uh, in this way, we, we could actually be able to link micro scale particle characteristics to macro scale response, let's say uh, soil water dynamics, which is very relevant for offshore structures. And these are some, some, some of the pictures that we have already seen, uh, some of the, the, the attempts that have been performed to really generate or produce this artificial soil. Uh, then another societal need that we have identified was to improve the safety levels of communities against land, landslide has, hazard. And we have seen quite nice presentations. We have seen quite nice technology that, that comes uh, and uh, let's say meets this, this type of societal need. And then the associated uh, experimental challenge that uh, we identified was to investigate the complex geo-environmental processes. So what is the interaction between, between our geotechnical structures? If you want embankments or cuts, What's happening? There is a problem because nobody can see your presentation. Okay. Um, I don't know why. The computer connected. Can, can, can you see it now? No. We can see that presentation. Why don't this one? In the Zoom, there is a problem. Okay, okay. This is good. It, it wouldn't be an event like this without a technical problem such as this. So I think uh, we were due one. Can you see it now? Okay, perfect. Okay, so I was relating now to the second uh, societal need, and this was uh, related. This was uh, to, to, to increase the safety levels of communities against landslide hazard. Uh, and then, in, in in this case, the challenge uh, that we we one of the challenges that we have identified was to investigate experimentally complex geo-environmental processes. So the interaction of soil structures or geotechnical structures with, uh, let's say, with the environment, with weather, with uh, uh, um, uh, rainfall, with uh, temperature changes. Um, and this is something that can be done using, again, cross-cutting technology. So this is technology that was not specifically developed for geotechnical engineers, but rather for our uh, military purposes. And these are the uh, um, environmental cha chambers. And these are some examples here of environmental chambers that have been used in the past and are still uh, currently being used to investigate such uh, complex geo-environmental processes. It may be in terms of uh, landslide or slope stability. Uh, so these, these environmental cha chambers, they, they allow us to investigate soil water evaporation as a function of net solar flux, air conditioning, air conditions, uh, surface type or soil properties. Uh, and then to, 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 de to, to dive into slope stability problems considering soil atmosphere interaction. So this is another example of how uh, this experimental need has been addressed or has been met by a very, uh, very interesting technology which came, came from, from other areas of, of technology. Uh, another example that I'm going to give here is, uh, is the societal need of providing community with uh, safety and infrastructure serviceability while relaunching the mining industry. This is, a, of course, a, a hot topic because of the increasing need of uh, rare earth materials or uh, just, just, just regular materials that are being mined and they, uh, they, there is an increasing demand for them. And in, in such cases, uh, maybe one of the challenges to investigate dams response under increased uh, volume of deposited tailings. And, uh, uh, some of the latest attempts that have been made in, in, into this direction was to use a complementary technology in this case, which is the digital twin based investigation. So the main purpose here, as you can see in, in the slide, is to create a digital twin of the, existing, uh, of, the, of the existing structure to collect data on the existing geotechnical structure, which is in this case, this, this uh, dam here, uh, using maybe phenometers or accelerometers or all types of sensors. Uh, then map this data onto this digital twin, this numerical model, if you want, then calibrate the numerical model with the existing data, uh, produce numerical predictions of future, let's say, events, and then really uh, provide information for, 
for proper operation, intervention, or decision making. And this is this is a, a quite a nice example of how how digital twin based investigations uh, can be used to to can be harnessed to to our advantage. A further need, and uh, I'm sure that most of you have seen this actually uh, live. You know, this is just a representation here, a, a sketch of um, of the tsunami generator. Uh, the, the need that we identified here was the increase of re resilience of road and railway uh, critical infrastructure against extreme flooding in, in Europe. And uh, how, do, how did we approach this? One of, the, one of the approaches was to investigate, or the challenges was to investigate coupled geohydrodynamic response of foundations, embankments, uh, uh, let's say riverbanks uh, subjected to scour and erosion. Quite, uh, quite an interesting topic. Uh, and again, a cross-cutting technology that we have identified here was the uh, were the tidal generators, which were basically developed for hydraulic engineering, but now we are using them in geotechnical engineering to simulate really those coupled geohydrodynamic processes, uh, which, which really are very complex and the interaction between them is, is quite, quite interesting. Uh, then uh, maybe approaching the, one of the final slides, uh, another uh, need that we have identified was the, the, the necessity to provide risk management tools to communities subjected to recurring natural hazards. And we have seen quite a nice presentation uh, from, 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 uh, um, from Samsung this morning, uh, which is really was focused on this. Uh, the, 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 the technological or the, the experimental challenge was to set up scalable real-time long-term monitoring systems. Uh, and this, this can be quite nicely done using the Internet of right. Things, which again is a cross-cutting technology, uh, quite, quite new, quite emergent. Uh, and uh, associated or, or couple this with a remote monitoring system, such as the radar based uh, systems that we have seen also this morning. So again, by, by combining these elements all together, we can really address these very pressing needs of, of, of our communities. So finally, this is just a summarizing slide in which you can see here on the left hand side, the societal need that we have identified some of them. Then in the middle column, you would see the experimental challenges associated with, with uh, such societal needs. So those are challenges that we face as, as researchers. And then what kind of applicable technology can we use to address these challenges? And then on the last column, maybe a bit uh, on the side of the slide, but quite, in, quite an important as aspect is the readiness level. So how, how ready is this technology for us to use it? How, how, how can we implement it? Of course, this evaluation here is just a very rough evaluation that we have performed, uh, maybe sometimes uh, very subjective, but as you can see, there's a lot, a lot of uh, uh, place for improvement. And of course, there's also, we can improve these numbers here, but we can also extend the table quite, quite, quite a lot, uh, and then find new technologies that could address new challenges uh, given by societal which, needs. Which number is better? The better number would be nine. So the maximum technology level is nine. This is when you can really take the technology and apply it. It's ready for the market. You can use it, and there's no no, no problems, no uncertainties. Relate, I mean, no uncertainties. It can be used. And the lowest number is number one, uh, where actually you're just you had an idea, you develop maybe something related to this idea, uh, but then there's not really much prototype uh, investigations on, on that specific technology. So most of the the ones that we were showing here, they're kind of halfway through being really fully usable by, by the markets. I think it's useful to dwell at, on, at, at this point as well, to think about this sort of uh, valley of death in the middle, where most academic research projects end up and never bridge across exactly. into practice. Exactly, yeah. And so, you know, we've got a few things here knocking around in the fours and the fives, and to get them into the six, sevens, eights, and nines and, and really out there used in practice is a real challenge. Yeah. And I guess that's where we can all come together as a community, both from the academic perspective within the Geolab Consortium, but our wider uh, users as well from critical infrastructure managers and, uh, and, and consultants in practice to, to work out how we take some of these technologies and, and actually get them used in practice. And I think also the very important role is, is played by people uh, like uh, the representatives that we had with us this morning, uh, like, like Geobrook or like uh, Hexagon, uh, people who develop such technologies, and we can see the georadars, they are actually TRL, TRL9, so they can be readily used. We can connect uh, georadars with Internet of Things and obtain those very nice systems that we have seen that they're active in Norway. So this is another important stakeholder that uh, needs to be attracted, let's say, in this, uh, uh, in this game. Okay, so actually that's it. Maybe a couple of more questions that uh, are going to be, uh, let's say, foundational for, this, uh, for the rest of this meeting. Uh, that we could think about. 
what long-term performance issues do we anticipate? What developments are required? And what other technologies, recent technology could be harnessed? This is things that I've been repeating a lot during this presentation, but I guess we can approach them in a more specific way. Okay, perfect, thank you. So thank so you, Alex. The, the, the technical issues that we faced were because uh, Alex uh, came to give a presentation and he left his uh, total commander post because he has been controlling everything. So now nobody was there to control. And you see the consequences. So, but now he's back. So now everything will go back to normal. It turns out that Alex is our critical infrastructure. <laughs> Okay, so I think we've set the scene there. We've talked a little bit about what criti critical infrastructure matters to some of us on an individual basis. And we've had a look at some of the technologies that we've uh, seen as possible techniques we can use to explore some of the problems at a bit more depth. But I think the, the, the next thing to do that's quite useful is to just gaze at the past a little bit uh, and, and look at um, aspects uh, of performance and resilience and the demand on, on critical uh, infrastructure from Europe from recent decades. So with that question, can I go to our panel and just pick their brains and get their thoughts on, on what, what lessons we might learn from the past couple of decades in terms of uh, future performance and resilience problems? Shall I start this time? So I think one, one of the things we're not looking anymore is offshore oil and gas production. But of course, we learned a lot from that going now into the wind farm foundation. So it's not a waste of knowledge, but a change of application. Well, we definitely made a lot of mistakes, and I come back to tailings, are how do you build these dams? And that starts with hydropower dams, which have been also just built, or also dikes, river protection dikes. They have just have been built by the people around, by the material available. And then increased and increased and increased and only since about 20 years they're engineered structures and we are still having a big backlog in that that's the reason why this digital twins is so important because we do we have a not designed structure so we don't know exactly how this structure behaves and we have also in the past gained a lot of experience with high-speed trailways but we are facing now challenges bringing the high-speed railways into areas where they haven't been, like softer soils, flatter areas, more uh, population in the areas the high-speed railways go through. So again, we can build on some experience, but the challenge is getting bigger and bigger. Yeah. I think it's also similar <clears throat> because what we learned from earlier is it was, for example, when we, when we look in uh, roads, it was possible to avoid some soft areas or there are a lot of road, road networks that are built with not this long, respective bridges, everything. And then in the last year, things in the last maybe few couple of decades, maybe things are increasing exponentially. The demands are getting higher. There is more urbanization and increased mobility and the demand, everything. So that's uh, a challenge that uh, I see that one has, uh, at least if I go back and then see, we were not prepared for this type of uh, uh, development or technological use demand from the society and everything. And that's some lesson to be uh, taken into account. So taking into account, having some foresight about what pressures might be in the future, accounting for things like population growth, yeah. uh, the effects of the changing climate, I guess. Absolutely. Are we saying that in general, we think that when we designed things 10, 20, 30 years ago, we, we didn't really have enough foresight? We perhaps could have thought a bit harder about predicting how pressures might change with time. Is that a fair comment? I, if yeah. I can add something on that, I think we had um, the confidence that we can design now very well that limit state. Uh, but probably what we have been designing in the past has been over conservative. Yeah. And uh, that back then was the thing to do to adopt a conservative design to be a safe design. But I don't think we can afford that anymore. 
the over designing. Now we have to deal with less and less resources. So optimizing the design, use less of materials um, at the backdrop of lack of energy, lack of resources, uh, the future design cannot afford the same practices. So it's all about optimizing and using as little material as possible with the performance standard, but we won't. I think just to, uh, to add to this point, because before it, everyone used to think local, isn't it? Now with the internet, mm -hmm. globalization, we have to think about climate that brings everyone into one thing. And then everyone is now pressed to do more with less uh, effort, more effective, more use of technology. And then at the same time, think about climate, which is going to be adverse in the future. So these are the boundary or constraint conditions that we need to operate. I, I agree, but I think this will introduce in the future a new hazard, because you know when you over design, you have redundancies. When you optimize, you you lose these redundancies probably. So there is a probability that, uh, and I'm talking now, let's say we start optimizing the more we can. In 50, 60 years from now, perhaps we'll have bigger problems with the infrastructure that has been built without this conservatives, let's say, without such redundancies. Uh, and we see now that uh, in many cases there are a lot of collapses happening. The Morandi Bridge, for example, bridges in uh, in, in the US uh, due to lack of maintenance, even for things that were uh, probably more of a design than they will be in the future. So I think this will be an added, perhaps it will be an added, let's say, hazard level. No, I, I think, no, I agree, but it's, it's not going to be easy, but we have basically, irrespective of what is the type of infrastructure, let's call it A, uh, aging infrastructure uh, all over the world, not just Europe, at the same time having to um, face larger challenges in terms of loads because of climate change and more extreme <clears throat> events, and the third piece in the puzzle is lack of resources and uh, the, that they have, we have to moderate the use of energy. So these three things together make it difficult and make it what we have to reuse materials that we have to, the solution cannot be built new. The solution has to be extend its life uh, with clever solutions. Uh -huh. I think Jan wants to say something, but whoever wants to chip in from the audience, please, please do. I think what's, what's addressing your problem is that we have to get away from the fact of safety because we don't know what the fact of safety actually says and we have to move into performance-based design all around for all kinds of structures. And this perform when we think about performance-based design, we're also going into resilience and redundancy. Like in Switzerland, if a road is blocked, you always find the way to the hospital. If I think about more less populated areas, if you block a road, you can have several thousand people with not having access to anything, and that for several days. So we have to take this resilience of the infrastructure that it will function, even if something happens, and bring that together with a performance-based design that we design in a way that the infrastructure will still exist. And I think that's the th change of thinking we have to introduce. and I Physical modeling is perf the perfect way to show that because a lot of people are afraid of it and they like their factor of safety because it sounds safe, it can be easily sold to people, society. But as it has turned out with all of the bridge failure and others, the factor of safety doesn't necessarily is a factor of safety. Well, for uh, seismic design, it has been proven actually but it is possible that you have a lower safety factor and you have a better response. But this is seismic loading. It's accidental, it's dynamic, it's, uh, it will happen once in the lifetime of a project. For other types of loading, you know, gravity is always there, so it's different. But I'm just saying that, uh, let's say, more optimized design plus uh, exponential increasing deterioration because of increasing extreme weather events, etc. I think what we're going to have in the future, more and more accelerated... Uh, let's say, damage to existing infrastructure. And this is something that perhaps we cannot predict at the moment. Perhaps it will be worse than what we think. I, I don't know. Just a pessimistic uh, or optimistic, depends on which side you are. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, 
actually it depends on the uh, I guess the country as well. But uh, one of the past major challenges that I see is the lack of um, uh, concentration or lack of variety of the using the instrument for soil characterization, maybe 15, 20, 30 years ago. Uh, now we have, you know, instrumentally, uh, we have been developing a lot of techniques which has been discussed, but, you know, how many of them were utilized 40 years ago when we were designing a tailings dam? Right. <laughs> so that that's also adds another, you know, spice into the deal, I guess. So there's an idea that we've got more data today, possibly not necessarily better data, but we've got more data. And so we should be trying to use that to improve our designs. Um, just a question here from from an industry representative. How would you define the performance of a pile compared to the safety factor of a pile? Well, uh, I didn't see who asked, but uh, probably I might be able to answer that if you Paul from Keller. <laughs> okay. Now, I think the difference is, for, like, let's say you design a pile, you get tip, uh, tip resistance and skin friction. And now you can put the factor of safety on the whole pile load. You can also put the factor of safety on the skin friction and the tip resistance. But you can also play with the pile that you will activate all skin friction and only then go back to the tip resistance. So that's also, you'd use the performance of a pile rather than putting first a factor of safety on it. Afterwards, you can always, if you want a factor of safety, calculate the factor of safety in a traditional way. Well, but uh, un unless it's a very special file, pile, uh, once I load it, the equilibrium between skin friction and end bearing will, uh, let's say, find itself according yeah. to the uh, <clears throat> conditions. I agree, but that makes we go into too much into detail. But if you build a pile, you leave him 10 centimeter, 15 centimeter too high out, and then you push him down, then you know you performed everything to activate all skin friction. So, yeah. The pile is a good example, actually, because first of all, if you have a pile in a material that is, uh, let's say, sandy, uh, what is the safety factor? If you do a push-down a push test of a pile and you plot the force displacement response, it will keep increasing. There is hardening. You keep pushing and it keeps increasing. So what is the safety factor? This is, this is what has led to conventional, let's say, definitions like we define the safety factor at 10% of the, of, uh, of the diameter of a pile settlement, something like this, because we cannot really, there is no plateau in the response. Uh, and especially if we think of seismic loading, actually we have been doing a lot of uh, work on this subject. Uh, what is the safety factor for seismic loading? You don't really care about this. You care about the performance. Because especially in seismic loading, uh, you will activate perhaps, when you activate moment, one pile is pushed down, the other pile is pulled out. Okay, so this is happening in a cyclic manner. Is it a problem if you have some non-linearity? No, it's performance-based. Uh, it can be performance-based design. Even for static loading, we can go to, as Jan said, we can go to a concept of not talking about safety factors, but talking about uh, force settlement response. So what settlement is acceptable? Uh, we can think of new logics. Yeah, but uh, that is something, I mean, if, if you uh, make verifications today, you have ultimate limit states, so bearing capacity, but we know that most designs are controlled by serviceability. So that means by deformation. Uh, actually, if I'm building a large piled rough foundation, then the, the bearing capacity of one single pile is, well, not completely irrelevant, but it's not what controls my design. It's really, it's the deformations. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, is this deformation then my performance? Yeah, so, so we agree. Okay. It's, it's performance based. <laughs> So the performance is the settlement. Yes, uh, I, I think, uh, you know, 
discussion can go for a long time. Yeah. I think I think the next question we should ask ourselves then is, having looked at the past for uh, problems that, that have come and gone, what are tomorrow's challenges for Europe's critical infrastructure? And perhaps I'll go to the panel first for their take. What, what do you think the key problems are? We've described some of the drivers, some of the pressures, but what do you see rearing its head as, as big problems we've perhaps not yet foreseen? Be Cassandra's for a moment. I think it's the maintain, main, maintenance of uh, existing infrastructure. Because all of the infrastructure, like for grid, Janice mentioned, they're designed for 50 years. They're now there since 80 years. No one is touching the money to rebuild them for the next 50 years. With embankment dams or tailing dams, it's even worse. No one really wants to get rid of them, empty the reservoir. And we have a lot of cases where at some stage people learn to live with their lake. So they don't want to get rid of the lake anymore. And now we have a structure which is designed for 50 years or 80 years. And in, it's sitting there for 120 years and the people want the lake and they paid money for the, for, for the environment. So I think the biggest challenge is this maintenance of existing infrastructure, which is there too long. And then the next one is upgrading for all of these new requirements. And that includes upgrading of power grids, upgrading of all of this type of infrastructure, which is not enough at the moment. And then the discussion which we had in the recent time, uh, in the two days ago, wind turbines, where to get where to get the energy and how to fund it. So, so again, is this chiming on the idea that there is a sort of lack of foresight? Like we're designing things for a particular design period, but uh, that, that design period is inappropriate because in the end, we end up using these structures, buildings, infrastructure for much longer than was originally intended in the design. Shouldn't we just be more realistic about how long we expect uh, the things we construct to last? Is that what we're saying? I mean, who, who of you have been at the Tower of Pisa? That wouldn't, probably is not designed for eternity. Yeah, that's very true. So is there a danger if we go too far down the performance-based design route that we lose some of the freeboard and conservatism that has ultimately led to things like Pisa actually, although it's failed its serviceability criteria and it's, it's met its ultimate limit state criterion for a long, long time now. Uh, and the building that I have lunch in 500 years old or something ridiculous, it's still there. I'm sure the people that built it didn't intend it to be there that long either. Um, so perhaps we should be more realistic then about those periods. Pisa is a nice example of an intentional safety factor very close to one. <laughs> it's like the ultimate performance-based design. <laughs> Samson, Stavrula, anything to add? Uh, yeah, uh, I agree with uh, Jan. It's uh, uh, maintenance is a challenge, big challenge, because we have huge infrastructures all over the place. As far as I'm concerned, road networks are crucial because of mobility, we know how much we are dependent. In Norway, for example, it's uh, people are live scattered, so it might have consequence if something happens. And then uh, I say maintenance because we are going to use these infrastructures for many years with unknown conditions when it comes to climate. So for example, for Norway, the predicted uh, climate is not uh, promising. There is more increase of triggering factors unusual combination of extreme rain event, yeah, weather events. So we have to design with something unknown, not with what we know now. So that's a challenge. And then uh, there is also more of these geohazards <coughs> that are expected. At the same time, our designs have to be climate friendly, that we have to think about climate. Now, for example, in Norway, we cannot stabilize quickly with cement. We have to decrease the use of cement because it's not climate. We have commitments for climate uh, regulations and everything. So that is, so it's two sides of things that bring us a challenge. There's, I think, another one, and you, you touched on that also, that is uh, the circularity of materials. So uh, we need to reuse materials, so what comes out of, out of, uh, out of the existing uh, infrastructure. And also when we design new infrastructure, we have to also build it in a way that it's more easy to reuse the materials at the end of the lifetime. 
I think since we're talking about design life, the first generation of wind farms set a very interesting example because these were designed, if I'm not mistaken, some from the industry more appropriate, please correct me if I'm wrong, they were designed with a design life of 20 to 30 years. And this was, if I understand correctly, for two reasons. A, because they were concerned about fatigue and how this might be in the long-term performance, but mainly because of financial reasons, because they thought that, you know, after so many years, they want, the capacity of these um, uh, structures will be too low for the grid so they will become irrelevant because by then we'll have far more uh, powerful um, individual uh, per, 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 per uh, wind turbine capacity, which is exactly what we see these days uh, happening. So what are we going to do with these things? You know, they have a design life of 20 to 30 years. I don't think they operate badly, but economically they are not viable from what I understand to still using them in the future. Uh, are we going to decommission them? Um, with uh, what are we going to do with that material? There is, I think, research of the reuse of that material, but from a geotechnical perspective, probably exactly for the reasons we have been discussing, the foundations of these things probably have the capacity to actually sustain much larger structures. So are we going to take them out or are we going to reuse them to uh, uh, found basically much larger and better capacity uh, found. So this is the sort of thing, but in order to be able to do that, we need to understand the behavior and we need to improve our tools. So to touch again upon what uh, Jan was saying earlier, I completely agree, but I think the missing piece is that we have also hopefully better technology. I think we have more or less nailed limit state, I would hope by now, but in the performance based, we are still improving our, th that's where we need to focus our modeling efforts and design efforts. I mean, looking at, uh, you said previously, maintenance, I think Jan's, uh, Jan mentioned this. This is a very good point. Uh, with respect to maintenance of existing infrastructure, you know, we had the project. This is the piles that the Labro showed you. This was from this uh, project with the Federal Road Office. Alex was also involved in this project. And uh, there we tried to make a database from existing bridges. And uh, I can tell you, and this, I'm talking about Switzerland now. Perhaps in other countries it's better, but I wouldn't imagine this. Uh, a major problem is that we don't have geotechnical data. So geotechnical data for structures that were built in the 50s or 60s is in many cases very poor. So how you can do proper maintenance and retrofitting if you don't know what you have. <clears throat> so I think this is also a major issue that we have with respect to maintenance. And about the offshore uh, wind parks that you mentioned, I think there is really a lot of data there that could be extremely useful uh, for maintenance of existing uh, structures, for new structures, for many things. But this data is not available because there is competition, these are private companies. So I think something is missing there. Perhaps there should be a mechanism that after, let's say, after an embargo period of five, ten years, they would have to give this data so that this is to the benefit of the uh, entire community. But of course, this is a political decision. This is not something we can do. I'm just saying what uh, I think. Yeah, I mean, it would be very good from my perspective in the UK if the Crown Estates said that, yes, you can have the lease on this part of the seabed. That's fine. You can develop it. But at the end of this lease or at some point in the future, you must release the data. Uh, I think that would be extremely useful. You might then start seeing the reuse of foundations to, to, to site uh, uh, bigger turbines in the future. Uh, but without that information being freely available, it's very difficult to do anything. Any other input from the room? Yeah. Yeah, we are uh, talking about current uh, major geotechnical challenges, but you know, I like to add current geotechnical uh, in addition to the current geotechnical challenges, there are current hydrological challenges as well. You know, some uh, areas right now, the original freeboard of a dam is not enough. They are getting more water uh, than what it used to be 50 years ago. <clears throat> so, you know, the, having accommodation of that additional freeboard brings another geotechnical challenges due to the hydraulic forces changes. Well, same thing happens for uh, you know, a lot of transportation network uh, at the toe of the slopes, you know, uh, the phreatic surfaces are increasing or decreasing 
depending on the you know the drastic changes in the phreatic surfaces, we are getting uh, geotechnical challenges due to the hydrological changes. So that something that we need to take into account. Samson uh, showed a very nice study that MPRA did, um, you know, uh, real-time factor of safety uh, check based on the hydrological conditions on the slope. Well, we cannot go that extreme maybe throughout the whole Europe, but, you know, some of our challenges is going to be due to the hydrostatic forces as well. So... Well, um, I'm going to, I want to say that uh, we have to be aware that uh, in a couple of years, the second generation of Eurocodes is going to, to be published by CEN, compulsory on, on almost all the countries of Europe. And perhaps the performance-based design is a, a good tool to design, but in this second generation of Eurocode, uh, the, the ultimate limit state design and cyber series limit state design is what this is, is done, is there. So it's, it's good to, to have a, a look at the future, but the, the near future is the second generation of Eurocode. So perhaps what we have to fight is against that, but perhaps it's too late, that's one thing. But it's it's not. I mean, this is not. Let's say it's not going to be mm, the the normal way to to design. That's one thing. The other, the the, the second generation of Eurocode also have some answers to the questions we are talking here. Uh, we are talking about um, how to uh, design for mm, unforeseen adverse events like uh, those coming from the climate change. Well, the second generation of Eurocodes talks about robustness, design with, with robustness. So it's there. So perhaps all of what we are saying here, we have to, to, to see to, to see in the frame of what is going to be the, the code that we are going to, to use. Perhaps not for the wind farm, but for the building and the civil, in, civil, civil engineer infrastructures, this is the code. And there is another thing I wanted to say, but uh, no, I don't remember. So that's what I wanted to say. That's, we have a code. Oh, that's the other thing. That uh, uh, Sen is all, it's also aware of the problem of the let's say old old uh, buildings and old structures, and there is a, a very large group of people working on how to adapt these. Uh, code to the uh, existing uh, uh, existing buildings and um, structures. Mm -hmm. So these are also some, let's say, legal framing which we are going to, to, to work. Okay, so I think, I think summarizing what we're saying is that we're going to be restrained somewhat by codification in terms of our designs. So much as we might want to do performance-based designs in places, it's got to conform to the code in most instances, unless you're living in the Wild West like I might do, talking about offshore wind farms where a lot of the time anything goes. Um, so I think that's an important thing to, to, to dwell on uh, for a moment. Um, Jan, sorry, just jump in. Just jump I don't in. want to talk too often, but uh, I think you made it very clear with the ultimate limit state, but we also have to consider who wrote the code. And having uh, now this Geolab and LGIP and all these sites and facilities, there we can try and show PBDs working. And it's like introducing critical state soil mechanics in Switzerland. When we started to introduce it 20 years ago, industry said, we don't want it. Nowadays, those students which went out 20 years ago are 40, 50, quite high up in the companies and they use it. And I think that's the same with the ultimate limit state. It will fade away at some stage. At least that I hope. Isn't there also a case to be made that if you're designing via performance-based design methods and, and they're, you know, in essence, uh, making sure the deformations conform to some limits across your structure, then naturally you're going to get the ultimate limit state for free. 
in most instances. And so perhaps we can start showing that more, more often, more regularly, and then the ULS sort of fades into the background of, in terms of importance. In earthquake engineering, this is happening. It has found its way to practice. We are doing it. What about cases where uh, failure happens with very little uh, deformation? So in case I have a very brittle structure, um, so failure happens without much, uh, let's say, uh, announcement through large deformations. Uh, I think those are cases where we still need an ultimate limit state. And those cases exist. Or better modeling. <laughs> I mean, uh, I'm talking again about earthquake engineering. This is why we have capacity design, ductility design, to make sure that we don't have brittle failures. We need structures that will not behave like this. Of course, if it's static loading, things are more dif difficult. So, so we need to, to consider this. <clears throat> okay. Um, I think we've had a nice look there at uh, future challenges in a very broad way. Um, can we just dwell for a moment on what we consider the current levels of resilience of the long-term performance of our critical infrastructure. I mean, how do you assess today's situation when you look at the infrastructure that you're designing or managing? How, how well do you think we're doing in terms of uh, building in resilience currently? Thinking specifically about projects that you might be delivering at the moment, if you were really critical and appraised how well you think we're building in resilience, what do you think? Maybe we can lean on our industry people a little bit here as well. But I see Jan wants to start. Not necessarily, but I think when we are dealing with a lot of tailings, and that is, they are very bad. It's, there is a lot of things to do and a lot of things which hasn't been done, and a lot of danger coming out of it, and we had the recent failure in Brazil. <laughs> but basically, one big failure a year plus whatever else happened, the companies are not reporting. So that's a piece of engineering where we're very, very bad. And probably I give it for roads to you. I think I try to summarize how we're trying to ensure resilience of our uh, road structures, which from uh, in relation to geohazards and flooding so we have this system that we are continuously trying to develop and uh, work on based on daily issuing of level of awareness about the level of hazards in each areas identifying risk and then in a very systematic and digitalized way of approaching the problem and with some integration of things that's how our way of maintaining resilience in our road network because it's required to have 99 percent of the time that we have a road network that is open all the time so yeah yeah i don't know we have much to add on this i would like to believe although i'm not on the design side that uh, when a project is delivered it's delivered to the best of faith and capacity of the of the designer so it's a more a matter of whether they have considered scenarios that we will be faced in the future to make the project resilient the, the structure resilient yeah i guess from my perspective it was a question about whether constraints on the project in terms of uh, budget or codification or other aspects of feeding into uh, uh, you know a, a limit on the resilience that can be built in today and i think if we can reflect on that then there's there's perhaps some input we could have to euro code modifications to try and improve that aspect of, of design that that's sort of what i was i, I was getting at um, I mean, one, one example that I have that I was involved in uh, recently was uh, offshore wind turbine uh, cables where 
you, you basically have somebody come in and put a monopile in, you get another contractor come in and trench a cable in, and then there's this gap in the middle where you've got to connect the cable to the J-tube with the monopile. And nobody really wants to deal with that part because they don't want to get the lay vessel close to the monopile. The people that put the monopile in don't really want to deal with the cable. And so you end up with this cable in a cable protection system that's sort of spanning from the monopile to the ground in this hazardous environment in shallow water with horrible conditions in the winter. And that to me is a classic example of a, a poor design problem. You know, effectively they've packaged up the work to different uh, contractors and, and the packaging up has created the issue. If it was all delivered by one group carrying all of the risk, they certainly wouldn't have designed it that way. And that seems to be how we're designing all of these cables for, for shallow offshore wind turbines. So are there any other examples like that where we're being constrained by the environment in which we're operating? <laughs> No, all sounds rosy then. Good. I mean, there is a problem uh, with resilience because it's what is resilience? You know? <laughs> if you cannot properly define it, <laughs> shouldn't it be defined in terms of design life, though? I mean, are we, are we just saying effectively resilience is the ability to go beyond the initial intended design life? Is that sort of what we're saying? But you're right, if we can't de de define what it is, then how do we design it in? But what's the difference to robustness or ductility or, uh, you know? It's, it's better to, to have better, to improve your chances of, uh, with your proposal, right? But other than that... <laughs> Oh, don't get me started on buzzwords. Okay. Um, moving on from that then, uh, given that the discussion is somewhat stalled, we agree that we want to improve robustness, increase resilience of our designs, but what are the technological challenges lying in our way? We've touched on one a little bit already, which is the idea that we need to improve our ability to develop performance-based designs, but what else is standing in our way? We, we've mentioned digital twins a little bit. It's the design assumptions. Because they they are based mainly on, on of course, now we have advanced numerical modeling, which makes it better. But normally these are design assumptions are based on Coulomb from 1700 something, a ranking from 1900, what a bit, Boussines, et cetera, et cetera. And none of these design assumptions, or very little of them, have been proven. And we see now with what you said with the influence of water and, and the hydro, hydro part of hydrogeological effect, we see in a lot of our measurements, sea patch lines are not there where they should be. And that's one, and also then one thing I think being very interested for all of this critical interest, uh, the, the laboratories, because these are the effects which we have to look at. And if you don't cover the real design assumptions for the seepage line, what else don't we cover correctly? And that's the biggest challenge in our design because the, most of the design is still done on a handwritten calculation. Not everyone is using the finite element model. And if they use it, they use the soil model, which is not appropriate. So we need to have the real design assumptions. And we cannot rely that Sagi is valid everywhere because everyone knows that Sagi is not valid everywhere. It's probably a bit critical, but I think that's why we have to look at it. And that's one of the tasks for this GeoLabs. And that's probably also why Alex came up with this relatively low DRL levels, because we're dealing with relatively low DRL levels, because we're going back to the base, or we have to go back to the basic of our design assumptions. Mm. There is uh, Eva. Oh. Maybe you leave a microphone there. <laughs> uh, one problem we see from industry side is uh, uh, materials right now. I mean, we know that our infrastructure needs to be more resilient uh, or more robust and so on. On the other hand, due to uh, decarbonization, uh, we are going 
in the near future or in general in the future to build our infrastructure with materials that are new. Uh, so we, we need to come up with new binders with a lower carbon footprint. <laughs> and the long-term performance of those materials is simply not known in a geotechnical environment. And uh, that is for us a problem or, or let's put it the other way around. The use of those materials is hampered because uh, we can't give any guarantee for the behavior of this material in the next 30, 50, 100 years because we simply don't know it. So, uh, who is here uh, from the industry besides you? Could you raise your hands? Yes. Two, okay. Okay, so I have a question for you. Uh, what is the reason that uh, you don't use, like Jan said previously, that you don't use more more advanced methods in design? What is the key reason? Because I think it's time. Time. <laughs> time. time. Yeah, time pressures. So time, actually it's money, right? Well, yeah, which equals money, but mainly it's time, especially on these offshore wind farms we're seeing at the moment, very limited time to take them from concept design through to detailed design so you know i guess with monopiles very well defined methods from pisa which are very well received but on other types of structures uh design methodologies are still based upon these old assumptions so we're using programs perhaps from the 80s still for these designs and obviously we're at ngi which is quite an advanced one might say uh institution for these designs but it is a matter of time Mm -hmm. We're pressurized by developers to design these in such short time frames because governments are pressurizing those to deliver offshore wind farms in very short time frames. So is, is it correct if I say that decision makers, we have not done a good enough job to quantify the benefits of using more advanced methods, so decision makers cannot understand this benefit, and this is why they are pressing with time, which means actually they don't spend the money because they don't understand the long-term, let's say, perspective. Is it correct to say something like this? Yeah, I would guess so. Yes, yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of the, I don't know how to say this in the right way, but a lot of the developers we're working with um, are not fully aware of all the issues that could occur. I mean, I mean myself also, but obviously our technical directors are, and not necessarily the sort of the designers are not validated by, in their practices, not, how do you say, in a politically correct way, but sort of like the, the the noise level within the developers is not as high as it could be, and therefore their um, uh, their base, their sort of what they would like from us is not necessarily the state of the art. And then we just uh, most people will just revert to the lowest common denominator on the design to make it as quick as possible and as costly for cost effective for them. Um, it all depends on the foundation type, the developer, and all that sort of thing. But yes, so we need to 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 put a bigger effort to explain uh, everything in terms of life cycle cost, mm. of the cost of reducing uncertainties and risk, and then maybe we can have a better design in the future. There is, yes. there is a comment. And then going one step further, like I'm also from the industry, but we are dealing with structural health monitoring solutions. And this is uh, actually something which we can connect here with the guidelines and uh, convincing of the policymakers and providing some regulations to show that the, the short um, cost increase at the beginning can provide long-term benefits uh, really in the near future. I think, I think there's also an element, Yanis, of academics developing these advanced techniques, failing to get their techniques across the valley of death that we talked about at the start of this session. You know, we, we create complicated constitutive models, we publish papers on them, we perhaps implement them in some trial analyses to show they work, and then that's it, we move on, we move on to the next, the next equation or the next parameter to add to that model, instead of actually 
you know, trying to make the techniques available to people to use in practice. And, and that's why I was so heartened to hear that presentation earlier uh, this morning uh, about implementing macro element models, because I think they're a really nice tool to uh, encapsulate complicated advanced behavior in a simple way that's deployable in, uh, in a typical, you know, consultancy world. That's at least my view on that. Okay, maybe one more point uh, because speaking of uh, offshore wind turbine, I'm also thinking maybe because it also involves so many people from different areas. Like our geotechnical guys want to do something very advanced, but when we develop this, people in the structure engineering, aerodynamic engineering, all these people think, okay, it's too complicated. It cannot be incorporated in our analysis uh, system. So, and also, I guess for offshore wind, it's very tricky, as you said, how we define the performance, the robustness somehow comes from the uh, electronic uh, part or other area. And they gave us some criteria and uh, we try to fit the requirement. We don't know how much uh, redundancy or uh, resilience left there. So this kind of thing also, I guess, limits the uh, development. I think in the end, it comes to incentive. Okay. Yes. <laughs> So you need to have an incentive. If, for example, uh, your insurance fee becomes smaller because you did a better job into defining, let's say, designing your foundation or whatever and defining better the risk, then you have an incentive. Then, but we need to work in this direction, I think. Yeah, I guess other people should come more to our lab. <laughs> I think... I can just comment uh, for the question about why we don't, or why it's not used to very advanced uh, things. Uh, when I started in Vivas and I was very fascinated or excited to use yeah, what I learned at NTNU, then I start to realize uh, the level of the people. It's important to understand what is the level of the people working in the industry because they are the one who's going to do it. Uh, I just feel that it's important to make effort to give a portion of whatever research we are doing for the industries to practice a little bit, because we have a different uh, set of criteria and requirements where I work than my friend who is in university, for example, that uh, people who need uh, a bit of comfort, something that has worked, that is something that has been recommended, and then time press pressure is also a big thing. And then generally in research, it's not much effort is done to think who would use it? What is it in it for me? What would I get? It's not common to just put effort to explain, to sell it to somebody. You could use it like this. It's just easy part of the whole thing, you know? Maybe not necessarily the whole thing, but small part of it, if it is given to that way, then people are prepared for next sort of development that can come after 10, 15 years. So that's why this gap is all the time. Yeah, agreed. And just to add on that, as had almost a similar thought. And it's a matter also of us as university or scientific organizations. We are judged by age factors. We are judged by citation index. We are judged by blah, blah, blah. Then we want to write a 50 page geotechnic paper. But actually probably in the UK geotechnic is written, uh, read. If I look in Sweden, outside the university, no one cares about the geotechnic publication. So, and that's the same for, for most countries, which are not, at least not native English speaker. I can't speak for the people from the UK or have stayed there. But basically, all these papers we write are read, read by academia again. And what we have to do is go down, go to the papers in the national language, doesn't matter which language that is, go to the paper which is read, which are read by engineers, and then we spread information out. If you don't do that and we stay on the academia high citation level, we are stick to basically English speaking publications, which Swedes don't read, even though they're quite good in English. But why should they? Germans, they read the German newspaper, uh, the German journals. French, they read the Vue France de Geotechnique. I'm not sure what Greece and the others read. In Sweden, we don't have any high ranked publication, but I try at least once a year, there's a geotechnic, a geotechnical issue of this more popular scientific journal 
which is available in all consultancies, in all entrepreneurs, everywhere. And so we try to bring, bring something down to that level. And that's the only way to, to address actual consultants. Well, sorry. Uh, as a contractor, we do a lot of design and build work. So design is part of our business, but design is rarely done with or done only with scientific papers. It's done based on number one, standard codes. <coughs> number two, some, some national recommendations uh, written down. Uh, and, and maybe then some statutory requirements. So paper is a nice thing, but it needs to find its way into those documents to be really effective in design practice. Uh, so uh, it can only be the basis and then somehow it needs to trickle down in, into all those documents. And maybe if, if you want to make it effective, so if you want to make your research count, then uh, you need to speed up its uh, uh, precipitation in, into those documents, simply uh, spoken. I, I think I just want to pick up on the word you use there, count, uh, because what's troubling for me as an academic is what's counted internally in the university system with respect to my performance isn't a publication in some of the outputs that Jan is suggesting we should publish more often in. It is the geotechnique paper, it is the paper to whatever other uh, journal is prestigious at the time. And so maybe, you know, as academic institutions, we've got to try and drive management to uh, measure other things, measure the impact uh, in, a, in, a, in a slightly less direct way, instead of just counting numbers of citations, you know, look at case studies and examples of where you've managed to translate something into industry practice because you didn't write the geotechnique paper, but you did something else that was translatable, that at least be my take. A uh, small correction, yeah, you, we talk about academic world, but there are also a lot of research institutes here when, in which um, yeah. citations is not an issue, but impact, 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 that is, uh, that is our message. Uh, Luke has a point, and then just a second. Ah, not Luke. Well, okay, yeah. well I, I completely agree with with him. The the way from from a, a test in a laboratory or a, a very complex constitutive equation in a paper to the code is going must must be a long way. I mean, in the standard, we can we cannot write. Any any development, there are thousands of universities, thousands of people writing nice papers with good results. But that's one thing. The other is those things go to the start to the standard. I mean, we have to be aware of that. I mean, it's not a, a simple way to say, ah, my question, my equation is fantastic. <laughs> Put in the code and use it. <laughs> We have to be a, a, a bit more cautious about that. I would like to make a comment, but, but after you. Uh, okay, thanks. Uh, well, uh, to me, uh, there is a wealth of information about uh, uh, case studies, actually. You know, whether uh, they failed or not uh, under uh, service loading, uh, perhaps, you know, the as a standard design practice, we may want to go back and then recalibrate our model based on the published and well-monitored site and then go back to our design problem. But what I wanted to ask uh, actually you is, uh, since you are design building, how many of those structures that you are uh, establishing a permanent monitoring stations uh, for performances? If you do that, perhaps, Maybe in 10, 15 years, you can go back and then recalibrate whatever the modeling is best uh, for your particular design work or not. Then, then it can go back to the coding and all that. So it's a long process, I know, but you know, design, build, monitor, recalibrate, and then just run the loop back again. Uh, I used to work for a company where we were uh, designing um, tailings dam. Uh, which we try to do this 
Well, I went back to our archives and then found some uh, designs that was done 15, 20 years ago. And then we had monitoring stations. And then uh, you can start implementing, you know, the what type of strength or what type of hydraulic properties that you want to put for that particular tailings material. But it took 20 years of uh, collecting wealth of data. So that might help. I don't know. Yeah, well, the, the to answer it very shortly, the decision to uh, say, okay, I'm scaling back a little bit on, on uh, let's say, safety factor and instead put in monitoring, that's not ours alone. So the, the client has something to say about it. And the question is, uh, if we scale back to offer a low price to the client, and then through monitoring, we discover uh, in five to 10 years, we have to return and do a little bit. Uh, who is paying for that? Uh, if it's us, then we will probably rather invest a little bit more at the beginning and, and don't have any headaches five to 10 years later. Yes. I don't want to interrupt you. I just wanted to make a comment. So, as I said previously, I think it comes to incentives. So, there is a model about what you described, which is called uh, design, build, operate. So, if a contract is design, build, operate, then you have a very good incentive not to be too conservative, not to be the opposite, because you will pay it in the process, and go as close to reality as possible. So, I think this is a nice model of contracting, because... It gives an incentive to the contractor to, to be, you know, uh, as close to invest really in the design process to go really closely to, uh, to what it should be. And the second thing, again, about incentives, there is a country around the world, which is called Japan, uh, where the gap between uh, research and practice is very small. Actually, the big uh, Japanese construction companies like Shimizu, Takenaka, I say they have their own laboratories, they do innovations like you have, but they are construction companies. They do innovations, they test them, and they build them. Okay, and there, the incentive is uh, urgency. If you have earthquakes like they have in Japan, your life depends on it. So you don't have the luxury to wait for 20 years for this to pass to the codes. No, the codes have to adjust. So I think in the end, it's a matter of urgency. And uh, in Europe, we don't feel this urgency yet, but we may feel it, we may, I don't know, because of climate change at some point. And when this urgency comes, then we will not wait for the Euro codes to, to adapt in the next 30 years. We will start really trying to save our lives. This is, this is my interpretation. Just a very short answer to the uh, operations. Um, I'm just trying to figure out what means operating a foundation pile, which might not even be accessible uh, once the superstructure is built on top of it. No, design, build, operate is a contract time. So, for example, you build a motorway. We have examples like there is uh, many of them. And the, whoever is the contractor has to design, build, and operate for the next 30 years. So if a contractor was too conservative, uh, they will spend too much money at the beginning, which, which was not needed. If they are the opposite, they will not spend so much money at the beginning, and then they will be paying for maintenance. Yeah, but uh, in, in real life, everything is split. So we, we are purely geotechnical. We don't build motorways. We may build the foundation for a motorway, but not the whole motorway. And so we, we get exactly those interfaces. It's a bit like what you said about the monopile and the cable and who is responsible for connecting both. Uh, there is an interface and, and there is a contractual element in that, a contractual element of risk allocation. And as long as that is not solved, I, I don't see this happening. <clears throat> I can. There's another. Okay. Um, yes, I'm, I'm coming from a railway infrastructure owner. So we, we are finally the one who receives the, the products. And what I, let's say from, from my point of view, what is mostly missing from the universities, or maybe let's say, also I need also the regulations finally, yeah? 
And this means always I don't need an FEM model or so. I need something simple, but which is still good enough for the quality we need to design the next phase or that the companies who design for us design correctly. But this, for example, for the dynamics in the track, completely missing. We don't construct dynamically the railways in Switzerland. Also from, from a geophysical point of view or geotechnical point of view. So we even don't have a simple model um, validated. Huh? And that means when you look for the process, you start with modeling, with uh, physical thinking, then you know from this, that's working, this construction, or you need the other construction. When you put it, then you measure if it is working like your model told you. And that's not only for one case, that needs to be in different cases like this. And this is, expen this is expensive, it's not easy. And normally you have to change the model then and then go further. So this is a, a circle of innovation. You need to go maybe several times. This is time consuming. In railways, it's 10 years for one circle. So if you have to need three circles, then you have 30 years. It's not, it's not working. And for this, you need predictive models, which tells you when you make the testing, you know in 10 years it, it is good or it is not good. Okay. And I think this is for several, as not only for railway companies. Yeah, it's... yeah. I, mean, I think the point you make about uh, there being a need to simplify our outputs so that they're accessible is really a critical one. And I think a good one to, to finish on. I've got a couple more questions here, but we don't really have time to run through them. And I've been encouraged to wrap up the session. Um, I think it's been a really engaging discussion. We've heard some different perspectives from different stakeholders within the community. Uh, we can see that there's some conflict between codification and people wanting advanced design methods to be used immediately. And so I'm going to ponder on all of your input as I write this draft report in the next couple of weeks. Um, so thank you very much for everybody's engagement. And thank you to our panel members who really primed the discussion with their uh, own take. Samson, you've got a, something to add? I want to say uh, something about this uh, design and build type of contract. We're also looking at it in Norway but not in a way that you explain that uh, those who build it will be responsible for 30, 40 years because they might not be there. But we should have a guideline that will ensure that in 40, 50 years, it's going to work. And then uh, we are uh, trying to do digitalization, making all the data available for everyone because we have to use sustainability and reuse of data and everything. And then this digitalization helps us to make codes uh, updating easy and quicker. So we can go in, for example, in one section about pile foundation. If there is some recent researches, it's easier to do implementation. But uh, as general feedback, when it comes to, for example, we do a lot of funding for research with the industry and everything, but we have a criteria. What is it? Uh, has it, uh, for example, more value for money, efficiencies of technology, and uh, does it contribute to climate? So these are the things. So I think Due to uh, this, I think it's also important to think about uh, funding for future researches because the industry has a different perspective than this one. And then that is uh, the important thing to think about and to sustain how we do it. And then these things will make this bureaucracy simpler than waiting 10, 50 years if we go more to digitalization and then show it or convince uh, society and put a little bit of effort to convince that there is something in it or yeah, users, thank you. Okay, super. Thank you very much for attending the session uh, and you. enjoy your coffee break. Thank you.